Hey guys, what's up? Welcome you to another video. In this video, I'm going to teach you what is literary criticism. I will also tell you a brief history of English literary criticism. And I will also tell you the major critics of English criticism. So without wasting any further time, let's get started. Hey guys. As I told you in the introduction that today I am going to teach you imagery. So we are going to start the unit number one, literary terms and the first term that is the imagery. And before we are going to start imagery, I would like to give you a small introduction to literary criticism. So let's start with the criticism. What is criticism actually? So if you think about the etymologically, the word criticism actually is derived from the Greek language and it means judgment and therefore criticism is the exercise of judgment on works of literature. It means that whenever a person writes a poem or play or novel, when a critic reads that and he just make a judgment that whether that work is excellence or bad. Okay, so actually a criticism is an exercise of judgment to find out the excellences of that particular work of art. So let's start with the brief history of literary criticism. Actually, literary criticism was started with Plato. So Plato is regarded the first critic of this world. He was born in 400. 77 BC and he died in 387 BC. So he was a very great person. He was a great scholar and he has written a book Republic and uh, in the 10th part of this book, he talk about literature and in that book, he put the theory of imitation. So according to Plato, he said that the God has created this world, but before creating this world, actually God was alone in this world. So he thought that to create a world. So first idea came in his mind. So idea is original and then he copy paste those ideas and paste it on elsewhere and then heaven becomes. Then he think that he wanted to make earth. So therefore he copied things which are available in heaven and he pasted it on earth. It means that earth and heaven is not original, original is idea and when a, when a poet or a artist or painter look at the natural uh, scene, a painter just paint it by coughing the already copy paste things of the earth and poet also depict those picture in his words. So in this way, poetry according to Plato is not once, twice but thrice removed from reality. So his statement was not agreed by or this statement of him was rejected by his pupil, pupil that is his uh, uh, student Aristotle. So Aristotle born in Aristotle born in 384 BC and he died in 322 BC. So actually Aristotle is regarded the original father of literary criticism and again he was also regarded that the father of seven different branches of knowledge. So he wrote a book Poetics in order to answer to his Guru Plato. So in the Poetics actually he breathed a new definition to the theory of imitation which was put by the Plato. So in the theory of imitation he said that actually Plato has compared poetry with painting but Aristotle compared poetry with music and he said that uh, the every art dif differs from each other because of its object of imitation, its manner of imitation and its medium of, medium of imitation. And in this way, he not only um, opposed the Plato's concept of uh, poetry as a liar and he put the new meaning that poetry actually it is a universal truth. It follows the universal truth. And after that, he makes some rules for literature. Uh, actually, he just suggests, but uh, the neoclassic critics uh, put these rules as a great rules. 
for example he put the three unities three unities means unity of action unity of time and unity of place it means that a uh, unit of time means uh, action of a play should be happen within 24 hours only unit of time a uh, unit of time uh, that is thing and unit of place means uh, action should happen in only one place and unit of action means there should be only one plot the next critic was the roman critic the plato and aristotle were the grecian critic they were born in greek and uh, horace and longinus these are the two critics who were born in Italy, that is the inner Roman Empire. So Horace, he wrote a book that is Ars Poetica, and this book he divided into three sections. That is the poesy, poesy means poetry. Second one is the poema, that is the drama, and the third one is the poeta, that is the dramatis or poet. And he made a lot of rules that uh, how should be a poetry or how should be a drama. And here Horace actually opposed Aristotle. Aristotle said that the greatest form of literature is tragedy but according to Horace the greatest form of literature is comedy. Let's move to the another critic that is the Longinus. So Longinus is uh, actually contemporary of Horace and he wrote one essay that is the On the Sublime. So in this essay, essay Longinus has said that an artist should put sublime in his literary work of art. So what is sublime? Sublime means to raise on high or to exalt or to heighten or to improve or to purify. It means that the action or the emotions or um, the excellences in that literary work of art should be higher, should be, should be uh, improved or should be purify the mind or hearts of the people when they read it, when they watch the play. Then we should move to the another critic that is our English uh, critics and the first English critics was Sir Philip Sidney. Actually he born in Elizabethan period. He was a contemporary of uh, Edmund Penser, the poet and William Shakespeare. So he has written one uh, uh, essay that is an apology for poetry and actually he has written uh, to give answer to Petrarch who has written one book that four ages of uh, poetry and in that uh, uh, book he said that the contemporary literature or contemporary poetry is actually iron age it means that there is no quality so in apology for poetry sir philip sydney has defend defended the literature the next and actually he was um, declared as a father of english literary criticism was john dryden so john dryden was the great poet you know that uh, he was born in the restoration period. Actually, the restoration period is also known as the period of Dryden. And restoration period started after the end of uh, Elizabethan age. That is, the, it started from 1660 uh, and it lasted until 1700. After the death of John Dryden, uh, restoration age ended. So, in the dramatic poetry, actually he was a great poet, he was a great dramatic but he was the greatest critic also. So in dramatic poetry, he has defined literature. Actually, he wanted to define only drama. And what was that definition? Definition is very nice. He said that uh, literature or drama or play is a just and lively image of human nature. Love and order out to be the subject of it. And the aim of play or literature is to please the people or please the audience so that was his definition next critic was william wordsworth uh, actually he was the the greatest uh, romantic poet and he has written the previous to record ballads and here he has given the different theory that he said that uh, poetry is a uh, he, he defined poetry as a poetry is a spontaneous overflow of power and feelings so that was his definition and here he has uh, opposed the new classical theories of John Dryden and other uh, new classic critics. So next was the H.T. Coleridge. He was a friend of William Wordsworth and actually he did not like the ideas of William Wordsworth. So therefore he wrote a Biographia Literaria. Actually he started uh, to write this book because the previous Rilke Ballad actually uh, only Rilke Ballads published in 1798 and actually it is the beginning of the Romantic period and uh, Wordsworth has uh, added prepares to in 1800 edition. 
so after that st corlege uh, said that it was a half of his brain and he dislikes some of the ideas and some of the theories of wordsworth so therefore he started writing biography literaria in 1803 and he completed it in 1817 so in the biography literaria he has uh, given a lot of uh, new uh, theories and new concept then uh, another uh, uh, critic was romantic critic was the pb shelley and his uh, the defense of poetry is similar to sir clip sidney's uh, the apolo an apology for poetry victorian poet matthew arnold actually after the end of uh, romantic period in 1834 or 35 victorian uh, queen uh, victoria ascended the throne of uh, britain and then victorian age started and in victorian age matthew arnold was the greatest critic and he has written one book that is the asian criticism and in this criticism he has uh, put that the how uh, criticism he has also introduced the touchstone method and in uh, in a culture and anarchy in that essay he said that the how uh, poetry can replace science with religion next critic the last critic was t s eliot and he was the greatest poet greatest critic and greatest catholic actually he, he was born in america but he was settled in england uh, you have studied the last year the lost generation concept and you have studied it t s eliot so he has written several uh, essays regarding the criticism and his essay hamlet in the hamlet he has introduced uh, the new concept that is the objective correlative and in tradition and individual talent again he has written another essay that is the metaphysical poets about the john dun and his followers and uh, here here he has introduced the two important and very popular concept that is the dissociation of sensibility and unification of sensibility so after the end of ts eliot actually uh, you know that in the pre previous we, uh, we, you have seen that every critic was a poet and he has uh, written a book and there he talk about Uh, his theories but after 1920 um, the critics came together and they uh, they found the branches and uh, in this way the new criti criticism uh, different branches of criticism started and it was the new criticism after that reader oriented theory structuralism post structuralism feminism marxism uh, modernism post modernism post colonialism these were the theories so this was the brief history of literary criticism i hope that you understood it if you did not understand it i will solve your queries so let move to the our term that is the imagery so what is imagery if you look at the word imagery this word is made by to means uh, you have just added ry here to image so image so what is image so image you can draw a image by the pencil or pen or by color on the paper and again you can also draw a image by using words and in a broader sense you can see here the definition that imagery is all mental pictures which are experienced by the reader of a poem whenever you read the poem any kind of poem you read it you get the mental pictures of that poem for example i will give you example of a, a hindi song for just uh, just listen me carefully now i am giving you example of hindi song which was sung by udit narayan and uh, the song is like that chand se gira hai koi chand ka mukhda wo ban gaya hai tera sundar mukhda so here you can see that how the poet is saying that and again you get the mental picture jaise ki chand se koi tukda gir raha hai aur wo jo kavi hai uski jo mehbooba hai uska wo chehra ban gaya hai so you just imagine the this kind of mental pictures when you read a poem so i think you got the imagery so that is imagery but c de levis defined it as that an image is a picture made out of words as i told you in the beginning that you can draw image by using color pencil or pen on a paper or you can make a picture by the words by by use of words and that levis said further and that a poem may itself be an image composed from a multiplicity of images so multiplicity of images means what means similes and metaphor so what is simile and metaphor actually uh, we are going to see simile in the next lecture so you will understood what is simile 
but i will tell you that uh, similarly like that uh, suppose uh, arjun is there hmm. suppose arjun plays cricket like virat kohli so here i compared arjun with virat kohli so it is called as a simile but i said that uh, arjun is a virat kohli it means that i have not compared arjun with virat kohli i said that the the qualities of virat kohli is in arjun so that is the metaphor so let's move to the uses of uh, imagery so imagery actually is used to signify all the objects and qualities of sense perception referred to in a poem or other work of literature whether by literary description by allusion or in a vehicles of its similes and metaphors so already i have explained you what is similes and metaphor so let's try to understand what is the literary literary description description means in marathi it is a varnan okay explanation uh, not explanation description okay manje varnan it means that suppose i said that he has a black eyes he has a long hair his nose is a straight okay so what i am doing that i am describing the person okay so the literary description is actually imagery or allusion allusion means what allusion means an indirect reference or a hint or a reference to something supposed to be known but not explicitly mentioned okay that is the allusion that is hint it, it means that the dull meaning for example you know that uh, uh, there are a lot of songs which have a dull meaning two two meanings okay so uh, for example you can see that uh, william wordsworth has written one poem she dwelt among the untrodden ways in 1800 so the imagery in the board sense include the literal object the poem refers to for example untrodden ways spring and grave these are the words words for use in this poem and there is also another word like violet or the star of the simile in the second stanza of this poem so let uh, move to the second uses of imagery so imagery is used more narrowly to signify only specific description of visible objects and senses especially if the description is vivid and particularized okay for example uh, marin moore has written one poem the steeple jack and in that poem he just make imagery like that listen me carefully a uh, sea the purple of the peacock's neck is he just comparing the sea with the uh, with the purple color of a peacock's neck i think you have seen the peacock everybody have seen the peacock so peacock has a purple color on on his neck so when poet look at the sea he, he was thinking that actually this sea is like a purple color of peacock's neck pale to greenish azure at the direr change and again that color also changes it it's a uh, you know that some shades changes to the greenish azure and the pine tree of the trial to peacock blue and gan and gray and again again he compared the pine tree uh, pine tree with the other shades of the color of peacock and he found all these colors in the sea so actually it is a specific description okay so i think you got it and number third is the commonly uh, in recent uses it signifies figurative language especially the vehicles of metaphors and similes as already i have mentioned you earlier so hence my friends we have completed this uh, session with imagery if you didn't get it please ask me in the comment section or you can whatsapp me you can directly call me if you didn't get it i will answer your questions and uh, i'm going to upload the notes detailed notes on imagery very soon and i will notify you when i will upload it on the, our class and then you have to download it and that note will be the answer of imagery term so don't worry about that if again you didn't get it please ask me in a comment section thank you for watching